Because you love music. We have it all here. At LDM Radio. Station. Solo hits musicales. Porque te encanta la música. Te la tenemos toda aquí. Only music. Only music hits para ti. Hello, everyone, and welcome to LDM Radio Sports Talk, the sports show that talks about sports and other current events relatable to sports fans. My co-host this uh, today is uh, Harris Berger. What's up, everybody? Actually, uh, every show for the past couple. I, I still got to work on my uh, my opening. Uh, how I'm gonna? It's all right. I'm that. here. I'm here. That's yeah, I'm, I'm not used to having to say person all the time, so this is <laughs> awesome. Uh, my name is Alfonso Caldero, and we are going to break into the show the same way we broke into last week's show, which is the Masters. What a weekend, huh? It was a great tournament. We had a, it was awesome to watch. Competed with football there for a little bit. People bouncing back and forth. A lot of people watching. Some pretty good TV ratings for the Masters. Dustin Johnson takes the championship. Gets his first green jacket of his career. His second major championship of his career. Won by a low score of minus 20 on the weekend. So 20 strokes under par. It's the lowest score in a major championship ever. Which is, that's a pretty big deal. Dustin Johnson is was the world's number one uh, golfer coming into the weekend continues that streak he's actually the first world number one to win the masters since tiger did it in 2002 which is saying something uh pretty good he had i mean he was leading pretty big coming into the weekend he had some people chasing him down goes out on sunday and shoots a 68 and just walks away with it by the time he gets something to the set walks up to the 18th green he's already got it one it's pretty nice when you can just coast in a couple notes from there. Tiger had a pretty good weekend until Sunday. He got to a par three, went into the water three times, ends up, ends up with with a ten on the on a, on the hole, which uh, you know a lot of golfers, a lot of amateur golfers like myself, we look at that and go, oh, he's human. He's like us. He's just <laughs> like us, right? So it was a lot of fun. Um, one of the highlights for me, because I hate the guy's guts, is Bryson DeChambeau came up, came in to the Masters. Before, I think I mentioned it last week, he said that the, uh, Augusta should be a par 68 instead of a par 72, meaning to shoot par. It's 72 strokes total on 18 holes. He said, nah, that's too, mo that's too many strokes. It should be a 68. Well, the guy finished one under for the weekend, actually had a plus four on one of his, uh, one of his rounds. And a lot of people coming into the weekend thought that he was going to be able to drive the green on different holes. He was all over the place, spraying the ball everywhere. Um, so that was fun to watch that guy struggle. Uh, his <laughs> analytics went right out the window, and it just came down to who wanted it better, who wanted it more, um, who was more together in terms of in their head, and that was Dustin Johnson. John Rahm, who was one, my pick to win it, finished in the top ten. JT, Justin Thomas, I also picked as one, one, of, the player, one of the young guys to watch. He finished in the top ten. So a lot of guys put on great shows at Augusta, but – it was nice to see uh, Dustin Johnson take home that, that green jacket. Um, Son-in-law to the great one, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, his mm -hmm. daughter is married to Justin Johnson, so it was nice to see that little family moment. They, uh, know, they know all about greatness. Exactly. So <laughs> uh, $2 million walks away with on the weekend, not bad, uh, for, for a weekend of golf. You know, uh, Definitely something that I would take. And the next tournament, actually some news coming out today, Tiger's going to be playing in a tournament with his son. There's a father-son tournament every year at the end of the year. Um, and his 11-year-old son is a golfer. And Tiger actually announced that the two of them are going to be playing in that tournament alongside uh, John Daly and his son, John Jr. So uh, that'll be a fun one to watch the, the four of them go battle it out, um, as well as some other father-son combos um, around golf and, and from past and present. So that'll be fun to watch here coming up soon. Uh, but for now, that's the end of the PGA season. Uh, the PGA picks back up in January when they head back out to Phoenix for the Waste Management, and we'll, uh, we'll pick it back up then. All right. So my picks, uh, Simpson w finished in the top ten. Uh, so that was a good one. But then Day ended up missing the cut. So that was a womp womp. Shocker. <laughs> and um, 
So, uh, but th this Masters was weird because they they ended up playing almost until dusk, right? That's like a weird. A few nights, yeah, because of the because of daylight savings. So a lot of Tiger, I believe, his second round he had to finish Saturday morning. So they didn't really know if Tiger would have made the cut or not. He was right on the cusp uh, during his round and ended up making the cut to play the rest another round on Saturday. That happened a couple times Friday. Our Thursday morning, when we before we got before we went live, there was a weather delay, and guys actually had to play back-to-back -back rounds on Thursday to get their first two rounds. Or on Friday, excuse me, the guys um, the guys on Friday had to go out early Friday morning, play a round, had a 30-minute break, went back out and played another 18, uh, which is beneficial if you ask some of the guys. Some of the guys, it's, it's a lot of golf. It's 36 holes in a, in, in a short amount of time. For those guys, it was uh, interesting to watch. But one guy that did benefit was Rory McIlroy. Went out his first round and shot a plus three. Comes back out his second round, shoots minus six, ends up minus three, making the cut. Um, actually put on a good showing into Saturday and actually into Sunday. Didn't quite make it there. Rory, Brooks, Kepka both had great weekends. Uh, the Nike guys did did what they needed to do to to keep their world rankings pretty high. Uh, Brooks Kepka coming off a knee injury looked really strong, looked like his knee was fully healthy and he's going to be good to go. Uh, people to watch coming in for the next tournament would be those two guys. Ricky Fowler is always fun to watch out in Phoenix. Phoenix is the biggest party in golf. They call it. They got the 16th, uh, the par 316 out there where. Normally, we'll see what happens in Arizona. They usually get fans, and it's like 6,000 people just on that hole. And it's basically like playing in a, in a football stadium uh, on that one hole, and it's fun to watch. But we'll see kind of with the COVID situation what that looks like in January. Um, that was one of the last real tournaments we had before all of COVID breaks out. Uh, but we'll see kind of where we go from there. All right. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be able to make that happen in January. It doesn't yeah. look like it, but hopefully – yeah. So uh, we're going to switch gears now to the NBA draft. Uh, happened last night. Um, the number one pick was a consensus number one pick for a while there, and then it ended. Up, he ended up just getting the number one pick, Anthony Edwards. Yeah. Uh, now a Minnesota Timberwolf. And in the, the, the most stable of the top three, if he didn't get picked number one, uh, was Wiseman. He ended mm -hmm. up getting picked number two, big man. Uh, for the Golden State Warriors now, and the biggest name, Lamelo Ball, is now a Charlotte Hornet with Big Mike. MJ runs that place, so yeah. maybe we will finally get to see that Lavar Ball MJ one on one matchup that that Lavar has promised us over and over again. I would love to see MJ just put him on put him on his back and and and, this, and put that guy to sleep. Um, that guy just runs his mouth and keeps running his mouth, although. I mean, you got to tip your cap where it's due. First two brothers, first pair of brothers to be drafted in the top five in the NBA, um, Lonzo and Lamelo. So obviously the guy did something right. He's a bit too loud for my taste, but yeah. uh, some people like him. You know, some people like that. Coming from a, a, he was a, a former uh, NFL player, right? I don't remember. He might have been. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they had that. Um, what is it? The Slovenian. Keeping up with the Kardashians yeah. or something like that. Back in last summer, they were a big hit, uh, trying to get his kids to the league. And now you got two of them in the top five, and they'll be going to get it. And it's not too far off. But I mean, you don't really see too much of Lavar down in uh, New Orleans. I highly doubt MJ is going to let him hang around in Charlotte too long. Yeah, the biggest um, thing they, the biggest thing he did was be a part of the Anthony Davis trade that yeah. won the Lakers a championship. So exactly, that so, is their biggest claim to fame so far. <laughs> is, we'll see. I know that that Charlotte team has been rebuilding for quite a bit. Uh, they have some of the pieces to do it. That this is another step in that direction. Uh, I mean, with the way that how lopsided the NBA is, a lot of interesting stuff. 16 trades went down last night. Yeah, yeah, very um, active. Actually, it's one of the more quiet drafts of the of in recent memory. Um, most of the time you get a lot of movement during the draft, before the draft. Uh, but there were some fun trades last night. Al Horford goes from uh, Philly down to OKC uh, for a first-round pick. So that was an interesting one. Philly basically gave up on Al Horford. Doesn't want them to be part of it. Doesn't want him to be part of the future. Uh, Philly has a lot of rebuilding to do, and this is just one of those pieces. Yeah, they might as well shake it up because they just they, they they made all these moves to combat um, Boston. They, yeah. they they went uh, they lost the series four to one, and then they made all these moves, spent all this money, 
and then they ended up getting swept by the Celtics. So, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they actually didn't improve at all. OKC was by far the busiest team last night, though, and and leading up to the draft, OKC gives Ricky Rubio his cup of coffee and sends him to Minnesota. So Ricky Rubio gets to go back to where he was drafted, um, and flip that for a trade. He was Ricky Rubio came over to OKC in the Chris Paul deal, uh, which happened right before the draft. Um, Chris Paul goes to Phoenix uh, for Ricky Rubio and a couple of players. Yeah, there were a lot of lot of people in that trade. The Sixers traded Josh Josh Richardson and the number thirty six pick to the Mavs for Seth Curry. Uh, Seth Curry is actually married to Doc Rivers' daughter, so Doc Rivers' daughter gets to come and live in Philly with dad or near dad. I he he always had some kind of family thing going on. on. He was coaching his son there for a little yeah. while, and now now, now he's, he's got, got his now daughter. he got the in laws. So crazy. I, I actually love that trade. I think that trade works out for both teams. This is one of those trades where it's, it's a rare win win. Seth Curry played for the Mavericks. Uh, Josh Richardson and and the number thirty six pick for for Seth Curry. Um, so that was an interesting one. Other than that, I mean, the draft went pretty much as planned. Everyone kind of just went down the line. There were no real jump ups to grab somebody, no real surprises, uh, things of that nature. Like normal, it seems like in, with the NBA draft. Otherwise, it was just a pretty quiet night. And locally, the New York Knicks uh, picked the uh, they picked eighth and they picked twenty fifth. So they originally had the eighth and the twenty third. They ended up tra- uh, no the twenty seventh. And then they traded up to get the 23rd, and then they traded back to get the 25. So apparently whoever they were looking for was already gone by the time yeah. uh, the 23rd came up. So uh, they, they picked uh, uh, O.B. Tippin, who, um, who, who was a lot of – he was the name in the mock drafts that I was reading about. Uh, so they actually got him, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, he and was definitely their guy. Fun known about O.B. Toppin, he um, – no college offers coming out of high school, went to play – as a postgrad at a prep school, uh, the name I can't remember, uh, played a postgrad year, ends up signing with Dayton, uh, wins pretty much the, the uh, college basketball MVP award at Dayton, and then now he's the number eight pick for the Knicks, and I think it, that's a good fit for the Knicks. Uh, the well, Knicks have so much rebuilding to do. This is just one of those the, first steps. Now it's what can you do in free agency is basically what can what the Knicks are going to be able to do. Which is the question every year because not many people want to come to New York. Not, not even if they throw enough and money it's the out. Most, but it's because of one person, and it's James Dolan. And yeah. there's no other reason why because the Knicks have – who doesn't want to come and live in Manhattan and play at the Garden every single night? I mean – Well, I think what, what, where it starts is it has to be that one guy who stands up and says, all right, I want to be here. I want to be a part of the solution. And then everybody else follows because it's, it's – it's, Unfortunately, it's a follow me kind of NBA now sure. where you have to have, you know, nobody wants to just get there and start the rebuild. They want to, like, go into winning situations and keep it going. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, they saw the way that Mello was treated out the door, basically kicked out the door like he was a, just, no, a, just some no, garbage. No, and no. That was that, not the case. Look, Carmelo Anthony forced his way out after uh, forcing his way in and depleting the depth of what the New York Knicks could have had if they would have just signed them in the summertime. Uh, it's a long story with, with me and Carmelo. Like, I love Carmelo Anthony just because he was a he was a performer when he was with the New York Knicks, which is a lot of guys come over and they don't they don't do exactly what they're supposed to do, but at the same time. He forced his way in. They made this ridiculously big trade where they could have just waited three months and signed him in the summertime. And then he ends up fighting. The only reason why they made that trade was because he wanted that extra year. And then when the extra year ended up coming out, he ended up opting out and doing this little, like, fancy free agency tour before coming or already going to the Knicks. So he basically depleted the depth when you got there, which affected the whole team. And then you ended up leaving – on for that one contract year that you were fighting for, where you could have just kept the depth, and if you would have just came in the summertime, they could have been a lot more competitive. Then he ends up forcing his way out when he's like, ah, oh, you know, I don't want, you know, basically he didn't want to be there anymore. So this is not, you know, like the Carmelo Anthony is not like a, a fairy tale story. Yes, he'll have his uh, number in the rafters at some at some point, but not a, not not a. Uh, I wouldn't look at him, at him as the same as like a Patrick Ewing, you know, where he just stood there he just weathered the storm and was just there the whole time up until you know he ended up uh getting traded yeah i i guess but you look at 
you look at kind of the way, I guess, but you look at the end of that, you look at the way he was treated on the way out and ends up having to retire because they can't get rid of him. He wanted to leave, but he yeah, forced but, his but way James out. Dolan, James Dolan did not do anything to help him. And then you have free agents look at it. I mean, the same case right now, James Harden wants to get to Brooklyn. Why does James Harden want to come to Brooklyn? Because he can still play in New York City, but he's going to play with talent. The Knicks yeah. have no talent, and nobody wants to come and play here. Yeah. And so, that's, the, that's the bad part, and that's not Carmelo Anthony's fault. That is management's fault. And who is at the top of the management for the New York Knicks? That's James Dolan. And they had the stuff, they had the issues last year um, with, uh, what's his name? The retired player wouldn't let him come back. Um, they had issues there and just alienating fans almost to the point that Knicks fans are starting to jump ship. They're just tired of the organization and the way that it is. And uh, am I, it, why would people want to come to New York when they can build teams other places with good owners? Yeah. I mean, Miami is a case in point with Jimmy Butler going down there to play for Pat Riley. Yeah. You got um, – Obviously, out in Brooklyn, L.A. with the Bus family. So they want to be in places with good ownership and people that are going to take care of them in the long run. And the Knicks have shown time in and time out, with Porzingis as another example, that they don't take care of their players. They, they're there to, to play and put butts in seats. And, to, and the players are basically there to just collect paychecks, and they're not expected to win, which for a big market team like the Knicks, they should be expected to make the playoffs every year and make a run. Basically, what it's going to take for the New York Knicks to be relevant at some point in our lifetimes is going to be that two superstars have to agree to come at the same time because it, it can no longer be one anymore. Right. It, it has to be basically two guys to stand up and say, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna make this happen. We're gonna make a difference. We're gonna bring a winner, a winner." Just uh, basically the same way that Kyrie Irving and uh, uh, Kevin Durant yep. theoretically went to the Brooklyn because they really haven't done anything yet, but. Um, that's what it's going to take. Now, um, you know, at years ago, there was uh, Amari Stoudemire, who, like, a lot of people bashed the contract and things like that. Mm -hmm. But he was, you know, they, they were willing to throw $100 million at anybody, and nobody wanted it. So he was the one that stood up and said, all right, I want to play here. I want to be the difference, you know. And then, you know, so we need somebody like that. Like somebody yeah. like a, and it just and it has to be two guys now yeah, because in this day and age, the, you can't just yeah, come by yourself. Exactly. You know? With the climate with the NBA now, it's a it's a super team league, right? Yeah. If you don't have that super team, then you're not going to compete. Um, it's not quite like other organizations and other sports where you can have one superstar and a, a lot of role guys that fill in the spots that they need to. Um, it's become a, a three-man league, basically, in a lot of places. And you see that in Milwaukee is a case in point with probably the best player in the league right now, not named LeBron James, and they still they can't get it done because yeah. – He's the only one, right? Um, they add Drew Holiday, so we'll see kind of what happens there. Uh, maybe he might be the guy to help them out. I find that interesting where the the news, what the news from Clay, Tom, uh, Clay Thompson ended up uh, from the Golden State Warriors has a, a hurt Achilles. He'll be out for the year now. Where the, I don't, I didn't hear this. Like I didn't look into the story, but I wonder if because the Warriors were rumored to move the second pick. And they just ended up not doing it. I wonder if there was any kind of – if the injury happened before that happened or not, even though, you know, they picked a big I, man. They, they could have gotten a haul, and they still would have been able to have the uh, – yeah, they, they, they could they could have cashed in on that number two pick if they chose to. Um, I wonder if, you know, if it was just the situation, the circumstance, yeah. or if it was the fact they weren't, they weren't going to have Clay Thompson, so they needed that, you know, like – the Impact news player. broke. The news broke about Clay Thompson's injury yesterday before the draft. It wasn't confirmed oh, that he had go. torn his Achilles until today, but it was pretty much known, right? Everybody yeah, close to sense, the situation though. probably knew. So the the Warriors knew they needed somebody that's going to be able to come in and make an impact because they can't lose out on another season like they did last year when when Steph and Clay were both hurt, and they basically ended up with the second overall pick and one of the worst records in the league. Uh, because they didn't have their two superstars. Now you have Steph Curry's back. He's healthy. You add a big man in the middle to help that out, which he apparently he likes to play like Anthony Davis, and he watches Anthony Davis film. I mean, who doesn't, right? The guy's a yeah, superstar. Who doesn't want to play? I want to play like him too. Exactly. So <laughs> this might be one of those opportunities where the Golden State Warriors decided, you know what, we can build a team around this guy in the future. Um, Steph 
coming off of an ACL injury on one leg now has a torn Achilles on the other leg. Who knows what kind of time Clay Thompson's got left? Yeah. Um, I mean, T's and P's to Clay Thompson. That's a tough. That's a tough way. He's just tr training with some guys out in LA and uh, basically the, Achilles, the two basically, worst so. leg injuries to have. He's had both of them. Exactly. And in a span of two years on two different legs, you know, yeah. and that, that's tough, especially in the game of basketball. A lot of run and stop and start and jump and so. Um, it, it's a tough situation for him and the Warriors as a whole. But at the same time, you kind of have to just roll with the punches in, in any league, right, and, and kind of roll through it. So we'll see kind of what happens with them. I think they'll be okay. I don't know that they'll be – I mean, they were the favorite to win the league again with Clay healthy and then adding Wiseman. And now we find out Clay's going to be out for the year again, and they've slid down a little bit in terms of odds favorites. But I think they'll still make the playoffs. The West is stacked, so who knows? Yeah. Um, the West, West the Western Conference stacked. and the NBA is really good. Yeah. So They need to knows? trade an entire team into the East. Somehow, yeah, somewhere. I mean – just to balance it uh, out. And, and the Suns got a lot better. They're going to be there at the end. They were just on the cusp this past year of making it into the playoffs and just missed. But they'll be there. There's a lot of teams coming up. We'll do a preview of the NBA season when it comes closer. But yeah. um, that's definitely a tough loss for the Warriors. It's it's weird to look at the the way the Eastern Conference and the Western Conference have been structured the past couple like the past couple of decades. You know, it used to flip flop. You know, like the West was good and then the East was good and then now it's like. For the past thirty, basically yeah. since like the the two thousands, like it's been all west, and they yeah. just are, there's nothing stopping them now. Ever since Shaq moved over, it's just been like downhill from there. Yep. So, um, one last topic on the well, there's uh, two topics. So the also locally, the Brooklyn Nets didn't have uh, any first round picks. They just picked fifty seventh. Uh, no, it's because the Boston Celtics continue to take their picks. It's so just how it works. Crazy. So speaking of the Death Boston taxes, and the Celtics get the Nets pick. That's how that works. <laughs> So uh, speaking of the Celtics, uh, our last topic is how do you feel about the three picks, the three first-round picks that they have again? I love the Naismith pick. I think he's going to be a good fit there. Um, the other two guys, it's going to be interesting to see what their roles are. Uh, and it also is going to be dependent on where Gordon Hayward ends up. Because if they do decide to deal him, um, then one of those guys can step in and, and take that role. But I think as long as you have Jalen Brown and I think as long as you have Jason Tatum, if Kemba Walker decides to stay um, or if they don't trade him, I guess is the right way to put it because he's still under contract. But uh, they still have a good team. They bring back almost 90% of that roster coming back next year. And Gordon Hayward's going to be the the one X factor in that is, is if he's going to be part of the future of that organization. Otherwise, I like the picks. I was I was more – Surprised that they didn't move this, the, their second and third first round picks. I would have thought that they could have packaged those together for maybe a free agent, or not a free agent, but for a, a bigger name, already established player in the league, um, or to move up and, and get somebody higher in the draft. Um, maybe in a way you, a way you, I don't know, I probably butchered his name, but. Uh, a guy like that, um, maybe even get up for – I mean, Wiseman was probably locked up. The top three picks were probably locked up. But you probably could have traded up into the top ten with one of those – with packaging those together. But maybe those teams that were in the top ten wanted to stay there. Yeah. Um, you got a lot of teams up there that are still rebuilding. I would have thought the Bulls might have taken both of those picks and slid back a little bit and taken two other picks instead. Um, they were the one team I was looking at, but they're in the same uh, conference – I think they're in the same division too, but yep. So no, the, no, they're the Bulls the, are yeah. in a different one, yeah. Bulls um, and Celtics are different. So it would have been a little bit. It would have that would have been interesting. Otherwise, I don't hate it. I think that they did a good job with what they could do. This wasn't a a very heavy draft in terms of hype. Last year, there were a lot of big names in that draft. Um, so outside of Zion Williamson, there were a lot of other big names that were up for grabs. And this year was. A very top heavy draft you had the top three or four picks and then it kind of slid so i like the naismith pick as i said and then otherwise i think that it just depends on what the future of that team looks like is where those other guys are going to fit in sounds like they can get they can cash in some more on a gordon hayward have a couple next year for two. exactly that's the exact these right. guys are the number one picks is amazing so we're going to move over to hockey now and there was a retro uh reverse retro 
jerseys or sweaters, as most people, as most ho most hockey faithful refer to them as, uh, were released on Monday. So this sent an actual, an absolute craze on social media and different um, avenues of uh, media. So we compiled our an individual top tens, uh, and then we have our bottom five. So we're not going to get through everybody, but uh, so what were your top tens on the jerseys? So at number 10, I had the Devils. I loved that green and red throwback owed to that 1980s, early 90s jerseys that they had. Adding the full green into that makes that look, yeah. makes that pop. It's a little Christmassy, so yeah. that's why I have it at the, t at the 10 spot. Uh, but it does look really good off a of classic design, just building off of it. I put the Rangers in at nine. Lady Liberty coming back was a, was a fan favorite in New York for a long time. It just was missing a little bit for me. It looks a little practice jersey for me. Uh, a little more red, a little more maybe another stripe or two in there as opposed to just on the elbows maybe would have made that a little bit better. But it did look pretty good. Um, I got the, the lightning in it at eight. Uh, that classic 2004-2005 Stanley Cup team logo. The only thing they were missing was the lightning bolts on the sleeves from the old, old alternate jerseys. Um, those people who remember hockey back in the day in the early 2000s will remember those ugly jerseys, but they were fun to they were fun to look at. Um, I put the Ducks. I'm wearing the old school Mighty Ducks uh, sweater today. They brought back uh, the old Ducktales jersey, and um, that was it was a fun design back in the day. I wasn't a massive fan of it. I wish they would have stuck to a more Disney design, but with Disney owning the rights to to the Mighty Ducks, you have to change it up a bit. But it still looks good. It'll, it'll be a fan favorite. It'll sell a lot of jerseys, and they'll take care of it. Florida brought back a, a, their classic blues. I wish they never would have got rid of this logo. Wait, where do you get Florida? Florida at seven. Or okay. at six, excuse me. Okay. Uh, six, the Florida Panthers go back to their roots with the old school screaming cat. Uh, the only thing missing are the, is the broken stick on the on the front of the jersey, but they brought back those classic blue jerseys when Pavel Bure ran the show down there. Uh, those were great jerseys. My top five, I put the caps at five. You bring back that old Olaf Kolzig, Peter Bondra, Eagle, Screaming Eagle logo. Dale on, Hunter. Yep, no. Dale Hunter on the back, on the red. Bringing that with the red, it just made that look fantastic. Another red jersey at four, I put the blues. You have the Wayne Gretzky blue jersey. But you put red in there instead. You flip flop the red and the blue. Those looked really good. So funny that's referred to as a Wayne Gretzky jersey. When that's Wayne what Gretzky I. That's played like twenty games. Yeah, but the... that's what I mean. <laughs> you could, I mean, you could think that was Chris Pronger's rookie year jersey too. Yeah. Al McKinnis played in that jersey. Some of the big Blues names, greats, played in that jersey. But I, whenever I think of that jersey, I always think of Wayne Gretzky playing there, and the, yep. that was the jersey that he wore. He is the great um, one with the with the music notes down at the bottom. Uh, that was a great one. I got the Kings at three. This was my top three was, are pretty much interchangeable. I put the Kings at three. I love the the Laker purple purple. Bring back that purple and gold with the with the Wayne Gretzky logo instead of the crown logo from the Marcel Dion days. But that purple jersey, or I think the and people in L.A. they'll they'll snob at you and they'll say it's forum blue. You can get you can f off with that. That's that's purple. All right, yeah. that's purple and gold. That's Laker purple. That's Laker gold. The Lake Show, Staples Center's back, all the way back. The Lakers bring a championship. The Kings are rebuilding. They're going to be there that Especially next with year. the intertwining, the Kobe Bryant. Like, there was already crossovers with it, so uh -huh. they just basically went with it, and they absolutely blew it out the park. Exactly. Right. Speaking of throwbacks, I mean, you talk about what the Avs did. at number. I got them at number two, bringing back the Nordiques logo. Sexy. It, oh, it's beautiful. You bring back that classic Nordiques logo with the Fleur de Lis on the, on the bottom of the sweater. Uh, but you put that in the Avs colors instead of the classic baby blue. That really popped, made it look really nice. That's going to be a nice one. I'd love to see that in an outdoor game setting. would be really cool to see. I wish they would have done that when they played L.A., uh, when they made those god-awful jerseys instead. <laughs> Both of those teams had two yeah. bad jerseys for that outdoor game. At number one, I got the Coyotes. Phoenix brought back the old Kachina head. They brought back, they teased us a little bit. They brought back the Kachina jerseys this year. They wore them in the playoffs. Those black Kachina jerseys were awesome. Throwback to the Jeremy Roenick days. These were a little bit after Jeremy Roenick's time uh, with just the head, but they they used to be green, and now they're just straight purple. 
They're like this purple lavender color with the lizard on the shoulders and the desert scene down at the bottom instead of just the striping. These things pop. They're going to look so nice on the ice. I love them. I think that the Coyotes did such a good job in a building market and a smaller market for them to have these jerseys. You're going to see these in a lot of different rinks and a lot of different arenas around the league. What do you got? All right. So at number 10, I have the Minnesota Wild. And um, one thing, my list is going to have all the retros. I love the fact that they didn't ignore their histories. Like, yes, all right, so the Wild didn't have the actual North, uh, North Stars franchise because that's that Dallas and it became the Dallas Stars. But it was played in Minnesota, and they kept the colors and the way they just blended it in because, you know, Minnesota, Minnesota, so they kept that connection. Really, really cool. I loved it. Um, Number nine, I have the Kings, uh, just because of the, what we what we spoke about earlier. Uh, you pretty much covered that. Yeah. And um, I'm probably a little biased because I, I do love the fact that they incorporated purple into the Kings and to the Coyotes. Um, but I'm a little biased because the Kings 2014, not a fan. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, number eight, I have the Tampa Bay Lightning. Who uh, who doesn't love the the old classic uh, look that they had? And you know they made they really made the colors pop, which is awesome. Um, number seven, I have the Pittsburgh Penguins uh, from a team, a fan of a team that always has letters across the chest. Um, I always loved the, the, the Pittsburgh Penguins jerseys with the Yammer Yager and the Mary Lemieux. See, I would have thought you wouldn't have liked that because it's literally just a ripoff of the Rangers jerseys. No, the, the, they had them. They, they had them. It, it, used to, it was just black with the yellow lettering. Oh. Uh, but now they have uh, the, uh, the white. I think uh, a lot of the colors kind of had to intertwine within each other because they're planning on using these for rivalry games yep. and playing each other. So that's why I think a lot of, like, the Mighty Ducks went white, and that's why the um, Pittsburgh Penguins went white. And yep. some, some uh, like, a lot of teams couldn't do everything that they probably wanted to. You know, um, we'll, we'll get to a little bit of the, the other color schemes later. But uh, number six, I have the Hartford Whalers slash Carolina Hurricanes uh, just because, you know, they, they brought it back already. Uh, so it wasn't really an, an exactly a shocker. But, again, you're respecting your history. You're respecting. Yeah, and they bring the back way. the gray instead of just the flat green. Yeah. And I, like the, I like the gray. That came out good. Uh, then we have uh, number five, the Florida Panthers uh, for the same reasonings that, they, that you gave. Uh, Beezer. I do yeah, love uh, John, the, John Van Beesbrook. He was my dude back then. Yeah. Uh, so number four, I have the Capitals uh, yeah. for the same reasons that you do, uh, watch the Capitals. And number three, I have the Coyotes, uh, just because, again, I love the, the fact that they incorporated purple into the NHL color, the great rainbow of the color schemes yeah. of um, the NHL. And just that one is just the, the way it looked. I think it was green uh, the, the first time the it first came around. The first ones were, yep. Yeah, the first ones were green, and then they, they switched it to purple. That was awesome. Uh, number two, I have the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, I'm a big fan of green and a big fan of blue, so the way they like intertwined it together, and that, those were the only ones that were actually like a half and half kind of. What a missed opportunity, though, and to, instead of bringing back that blade uh, some logo, people, put that blade yeah, logo on that jersey. Yeah, is what dude. they missed that opportunity. Uh, a, a couple people missed the missed the boat oh, on yeah, there. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in the, yeah, bo in the bottom <laughs> five. But uh, number one's Colorado, just yeah. because they that's just a, 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 like you're the that's the ultimate where your heritage, where you came from. It's the blending and just mixing it into the that one just epitomized what all of this is about, mm -hmm. and it was that was they just really knocked it out the ballpark with that Absolutely. one because uh, Qu Quebec, you know, like they they had their issues with the uh, you know financially they couldn't stay there and all that. Um, also, that was the same thing that happened to the Winnipeg Jets, and then once they put a franchise back over there, it was like they realized what they were missing and now like the Winnipeg Jets have a uh, great attendance, great home atmosphere. I think eventually the NHL gets back into Quebec and then the fans there will, you know, appreciate Embrace it more. It. Yeah, and absolutely. yeah, so uh, when that happens, I don't know exactly, but uh, that's what I have. So we're going to go just bottom five. You want to trade off on these? One, 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 one. No. Nah. No, just run it through. Yeah. All right. At number five, I got the Edmonton Oilers. I think that these are pretty – they're not a big – So difference. you're saying that's the, wor that's, that's the worst No, 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 that's my fifth okay, worst so one. Fifth worst. So five to one. I'll go through them to what I hate the most. All right. Um, the Oilers, I think it's too close to what they've already had the last few years. They rebranded with the blue and orange. They stuck with that. I think they missed the mark a little bit. I think they could have gone back to that metal oil drop jerseys that they had a few years – or ten years ago uh, when Rexall Place was really bumping. Um, 
you could have had a lot of different things to go in there, and, and they kind of just stuck with what they what they know. Uh, at four, I got the Ottawa Senators. They went back to the old logo, which they're already doing with their regular jerseys. So just to incorporate red instead of they already they're already doing black and white for their home and aways. So now you just have a red one that's the same. I didn't think that they really took the reverse retro thing um, a little bit serious. You could have gone with the big O in the center. Like like they, they, they just have like 17 jerseys a year. Yeah, they they're have always- a ton of jerseys, and they just I think that there just wasn't a lot of effort really put into this one and we'll get they certainly put in more effort than the next three but um <laughs> in my opinion but these for that one i think that there was a lot more that the senators could have done um at three i got minnesota i didn't like i like the ode sure you gave the ode to the to the north stars and and to the heritage that minnesota hockey brings but i guess they really didn't have a ton to work with in terms of because the Wild organization is so young, and they really haven't changed their jerseys too much over time. Uh, only a couple of times. I would have liked to have seen them bring back the old Minnesota across the chest. Um, that would have been fun to see or something of that nature. Uh, the North Star, it just looked a little plain to me with the, the North Star's colors. Um, it just reminds me kind of of just a like a beer league jersey. It didn't think it doesn't bring that NHL jersey right. to to my mind. Um, and then we get into the two worst efforts I think uh, put into this. I'll put I'm switching my list. I actually have them written one and two, and I'm switching them. I'm gonna put Detroit as my second worst. This is a practice jersey. There's no question about it. Um, they stuck the the traditional Red Wings logo on the on the chest, and they have gray stripes on this on the elbows, and that's it. They could have gone back to the old um, multiple striped red and white jerseys. Like remember when they did the outdoor game against Detroit, they did something very or against Toronto, excuse me, they did something very similar. Then this was a perfect time to do that to bring that back or the old school D Detroit D that everybody knows and loves. They had so much opportunity here, especially with an original six franchise. So many different jerseys from the inception of that franchise that they just didn't bring back, and they kind of just went through the motions and came out with this jersey. The worst jersey on my list, the New York Islanders, 100%. This was a, this was, you know when you were in college or when you were in high school and you forgot to do your homework and yeah. the assignment's due in like 20 minutes and you take your buddies <laughs> and you just change a couple words around? Yeah. That's what the Islanders did. <laughs> so it's the Islanders' same, it's the same jersey that they've had for the last 10 years. They just darkened the blue a bit. Yeah. So uh, there's nothing different about this jersey. What a perfect time to bring the fishermen back. Um, or just anything different. And they didn't do anything different. They used to have those black jerseys that said Islanders just across the front with the number uh, from I think JT was a rookie when they when they actually had those jerseys. You could have brought a white one back um, or or an orange one for that matter would have been fun. But for this one, it just they they didn't do anything different. You know, they just went back to that old school blue and orange and um, didn't change didn't make any changes and it just. Yeah. Why not put something in it for the island, you know? But you, I mean, the logo's already got the O to the island in there. Yeah. Um, but the Fisherman jersey was a classic and a fan favorite. All right, I so I just want to remind everybody that Harris is a Boston Bruin fan, and he's not speaking from a Ranger fan perspective. No, I'm not. Like, yeah, and I, and I no didn't New include – yeah. And you know what? And I'll say as an honorable mention, the Bruins did a good job with theirs. I, I like the yellow. I like that old school spoke B. Um, better than the new spoke be actually. Uh, I wish they would have put Bruins fans call it the crack bear. It's the old school, <laughs> old school original six bear. Yeah. Um, it's actually on the shoulders of the New Jersey. I wish they would have put that on the front. I'm just happy they didn't bring back old Pooh Bear. Yeah. Um, that was the worst jersey the Bruins ever put out in the Byron Defoe days, um, Joe Thornton's rookie year days. Those were just terrible jerseys. I'm so happy they didn't bring those back. I like the yellow. They've done yellow before in the Winter Classic, things like that. And it's worked out in the past, so uh, I like these jerseys. We'll see kind of where they go. But they didn't really – they stood out in terms of – but they're kind of middle of the pack for me. All right, so before I get into my bottom five, I'm just going to say some notable mentions. One of them is my favorite team, the New York Rangers. Uh, I do love the Statue of Liberty jersey. I love it all. Like, I've, I have the jersey. Luckily, I – I was able to reacquire it after throwing it out when I was uh, in high school, thinking that, you know, not knowing that it would never come back. Um, 
I, I think what was missing here was just to make it red instead of making it blue. But again, uh, it was a coordinated effort with all the jerseys. I think there was five other jerseys that came out that were red. I'm sure not everybody could have <laughs> came out red. Or in this situation, they could have actually come out and be one of the gray teams just because they did have gray on the sleeves in the original mm -hmm. jersey and they had gray in the in the emblem itself. Um, that could have happened. It would have made it just a little different. That probably would have made, pissed a lot of fans off. Uh, Rangers are a very uh, tough fan base uh, when it comes to popular opinions. Yeah. But um, that's why I didn't make the top ten. I do love the jersey. And um, the St. Louis Blues jersey I do love as well And um, for the same reasons you mentioned. And Vegas, uh, without having any retro work yeah. experience to work with, uh, not even being half a decade old, yeah. uh, they did they – did, a fine job with their jersey. Yeah, uh, essentially they, they got a third jersey, right? Yeah, so. they, they got like their, their their one stripe of red that they have on their regular jerseys. They yeah. ended up like expanding on that, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it looks good. Um, so, bottom five uh, coming in at thirty uh, twenty seven is the San Jose Sharks. I do not like the gray on them. Man, I I, you know this was one of those middle of the pack ones for me. I thought that. I liked the old shark without the stupid orange eye that the regular jerseys have. Mm -hmm. um, these jerseys, to me, remind me of the Owen Nolan days, the big bad sharks, the shark yeah. tank, when the shark tank was born. I liked them, but, yeah, you're right. I, they, they were a little lackluster, but I think, like you said, that yeah. a lot of teams didn't have a lot of choices when it came to color schemes, yeah. so this is one of those that they might have just been able to work with what they got. So Dallas uh, comes in at number yeah. 28, and they, they have four jerseys. Uh, this one's like super predominantly white. They also came out with like a like a, a highlighter green one. It's better than uh, that green one. Green and black These are one. better than that Yeah, one. so they just got a lot going on over there. Um, didn't love it that much. The, the, the Red Wings one that you mentioned that I'd say, you know, like they didn't really have much to work with as far as like traditional goes. Like they pretty much pumped out everything they could. Uh, this Dallas one could have definitely uh, been a little different there. Um, yeah. That's a w yeah, so it's an old to uh, the Dallas Skyline yeah. jerseys, those old school, those new ones that they uh, do. 20, uh, 29 is the Winnipeg Jets, uh, yeah. the gray again. I, I think, you know, like it was a, it's a dynamic jersey. They had a lot of colors to work with. They picked gray. It's kind of weird. Um, number 30 is the New York Islanders. Uh, they should have 100% brought back the fishermen. Now, back in the day, like when in the 90s when these were out a lot of people hated them yeah. the, their fan base actually hated them themselves but then you look at it 20 years later that every everything that's old is new again and everybody mm -hmm. wants the retro like these jerseys are going for like over $200 on mm -hmm. on uh, eBay's and things like that you know for a jersey that everybody hated when it was out you know yeah. and you you know you would have definitely like uh, they actually said that they're going to come out with uh, fisherman merchandise now which is good because you know, it cuts into that secondary market because like there's there's host there's people who have these jerseys that are just benefiting and you know black black blackballing every every other like real Islanders fan yeah. who just wants it just because you know they liked it. Um, so they could have definitely just brought it back and avoided all of that. The, yeah. They ended up just going with the regular logo, and their their sales are going to suffer because people have like 23 of these different jerseys anyway. So, you know, they don't need that one. Yep. And um, the last one is the Toronto Maple Leafs. I do not like the basicness of it. Boy, with the did they miss shoulders. the Toronto St. Pat's throwback. Yeah. That could have been such a fun one. Um, with I wish different color the, combinations. Or the 1963 Leafs jersey with the old logo. Same thing when they played Detroit in the outdoor game. They used that logo. They should. They could have brought that back for this one, and they didn't. Not, not that they had a whole health of a lot of – Stuff to, stuff to work with, but, yeah. you know. So uh, we're going to touch on the NFL a little bit here. So now there's there's a degree of separation between the haves and the have-nots, and now it looks like there's, like, two team races. Boy, can we start in one spot because I got yes. something to say yeah. because the NFC East continues to just be abysmal. That good division was all but gift wrap so for the bad. Eagles, and they just don't want to take it. So bad. And now the Giants are going to win the division. And I'm telling you right now, Doug Peterson deserves to lose his job. Doug Peterson does not deserve to be the coach in Philadelphia. I don't care how many times yeah, you win their yeah. first Super Bowl. You do not deserve to just – that doesn't – you don't get to skate by on that anymore. And a healthy Carson Wentz. So, like, he used to, healthy and he's used to be his only too. issue, and the now that he's healthy. Are, yeah, he's the two awful. of them are done in Philadelphia if they don't win this division. Doug Peterson has been – they've just been abysmal. The Giants have a bad defense. They have a bad – they don't have a, a starting running back. Their star running back has a torn ACL. 
Daniel Jones is a middle of the road quarterback, and he's he shredded them over the weekend. Yeah. And now the the Eagles have a tough road ahead of them. They have a they have a tough schedule down the stretch. They play the Giants again, if I'm not mistaken. But they, I mean, you have they both have the Cowboys left, who are just awful, and they both have the R words, who are still on the schedule. Or the team with no name. So no, nah, the uh, Giants are done with them. They, they oh, beat the them Giants twice. already played them. Two twice. of the three so, wins that they have is against the no names. See, so there you go. But I look the the Eagles are just god awful. They don't have any. They don't. They don't have any identity. It's just you see, like they they show flashes of greatness. They played that. They, they played the Steelers close until the fourth quarter. They. I mean, but then you go out and you lay an egg against the Giants last week. And now you have a tough schedule. I don't see how they can continue on the road that they're on and still win. I mean, let's be honest. A team with five wins might win this division, but it's, I don't think it's going to be the Eagles. And at that point, you have to fire Doug Peterson. Absolutely awful. The only thing that will save him is that tie. That yeah, but, you, tie. But, but, I mean, that's ridiculous too. At that <laughs> point, you still have to fire Doug Peterson. If they don't win the division, he's got to go. All right, I so don't care how many times you win that division. Philly fans will not stand for that, especially in a climate now where the door's open because – Dallas was had this division all but wrapped up week two. And once Dak goes down, then it went wide open. And the Eagles walked through the door and were basically handed the division. And now they've given it back. And now the Giants are turning things around. They look good against Tampa. Now they get a win against the Eagles. And now they continue to roll. They had a little bit of an issue this week. I don't know. We, we want to touch on that. Joe Judge and Mark Colombo. Uh, reportedly didn't have a fist fight, but words were exchanged, and uh, he was fired. Firing an offensive line coach in the middle of the week is an interesting move. We'll see how that pans out. Uh, but the Giants are trending in the right direction. The Eagles are trending in the wrong direction, and that's, I mean, you ha at that point, something's got to change. Yeah, looking at, this, uh, look, looking at this division of four teams, the Giants certainly look like the clear-cut favorites, which yeah. is absolutely Incredible at three and seven. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so this is 2020, though. So that's absolutely not weird. I mean, weird when it comes can to happen. that. Uh, so we're we're gonna run down real quick. So the uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say where the where the division is, and you pick the winner. So we got the seven and three Bills and the six and three Miami Dolphins in the AFC East. We're not even gonna we're not even gonna put the Patriots name. The guys, yeah, the guys want the, the team that's won the division every year for the last 20 years. We're not even going to give them. They come off a big win against the team that they thought were going to get rolled over. They beat, they blow, they, I mean, they held Lamar Jackson under 20 points for the first time all season. I don't care what the weather was like. All right. you, you hold a former MVP. I, look, I don't think the Patriots are going to win the division, but their name needs to be there. They, they completely turn that around. Camp's finding his form. But I think the Bills are going to win that division. I think that they're going to they'll be able to slow Tua down. Tua's looked really good. He's three and zero. Dolphins are five five and zero in their last five games. But I think the Bills are there. All right, AFC North. We have the uh, Steelers at nine and zero. The Baltimore Ravens at six and three, and the Cleveland Browns at six and three. Steelers. It's not even close. The Steelers might go undefeated. Who, who, I don't think they will. Who out of those three misses the playoffs? Uh, the Browns. Okay. Yeah, the Browns will. The Browns will miss. Uh. Yeah, it's going to depend on how the Ravens look on Thursday, on Thanksgiving against the Steelers. Yeah. That's going to be a big determination. The Browns still have to play the Steelers again. But I think that the Ravens are a better team than the Browns, but the Browns are going to be there for a couple years to come. Indianapolis Colts um, and the ten Tennessee Titans, both 6-3 and three in the AFC South. Colts. Yep, Colts. I mean, the Tennessee. I'm going to go Titans just because Henry. Tennessee's pass game um, is non-existent at this point without Taylor Lewan as their left tackle. Uh, he's just not there. Right? Their their team needs to figure it out. They got steamrolled by by the Colts on Thursday night last week, right after our show, and they just they the last couple of weeks they haven't looked good at all. AFC West, uh, Kansas City Chiefs eight and one, uh, uh, Raiders six and three facing each other this week. Chiefs, Chiefs are going to blow them out this weekend. It's not even going to be close. The one loss was against the Raiders. Yep, and then they supposedly did victory laps around Arrowhead and. Andy Reid has got those guys fired up going into Vegas this weekend. I wouldn't be surprised for Mahomes to throw four touchdowns this weekend. All right, NMC North. We have the Packers at seven and two, the Chicago Bears at five and five, and the rest of the division at four and five. Bears stink. The Bears are not making the playoffs. They are going to come in third in that division. Actually, they might even come in last in that division because the Lions are starting to figure it out a little bit with Matty Stafford. Uh, but the Packers will win that division by a long shot. 
NFC South, we have the uh, New Orleans Saints at 7-2 and two, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at 7-3. and three. Boy, this is going to be close because Drew Brees is down with that collapsed lung and a couple of broken ribs. So it's going to be a question of how good Jameis Winston can be without Drew Brees and how good the Saints can be without Drew Brees. Alvin how Kamara missed practice. He's out at least two weeks, they said. So um, Alvin Kamara missed practice today dealing with a foot injury. So that's something to watch going into the weekend. But – We'll see kind of where they go. They have a tough matchup this weekend. If they get with Atlanta, it's an interdivision matchup. Atlanta's starting to figure out they're coming off of a bye. It's going to be interesting to see how Jameis can do. Can he step up like Teddy Bridgewater did last year for them and continue? If that's the case, then the Saints will win that division. Otherwise, the Bucks will take that division. But both of them make the playoffs. And in the most competitive NFC division, uh, well, actually being good, yeah. the most competitive one, is uh, the Arizona Cardinals – the Los Angeles Rams and Seattle Seahawks all in at six and three. Man, I I love the Cardinals. I really love the Cardinals. The Rams are really good though. Uh, they have a really good pass rush. We'll see kind of where they go. Um, but the Cardinals, they play tonight. Cardinals Seahawks tonight. Uh, Cardinals are three point underdogs. I like the Cardinals on the road in Seattle. I like them to win outright actually uh, tonight in Seattle. Kyler Murray coming off that Hail Mary to beat the to win last week. Uh, I think he just continues to roll. He's going to throw all over that bad defense in Seattle. Tyler Lockett's banged up. Still no running game for Seattle. Russell Wilson can only do so much. I love Kyler Murray. Uh, I got He's slowly climbing into my MVP category right now. Um, and I know I mentioned a couple weeks ago that I like Russell Wilson, but over the last couple weeks I'm going to change my pick. I like Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is my MVP front runner at this point. Turning the ball, Russ has had turnover issues. Uh, eight turnovers in his last three games, that's too many. Been rough. Um, I know he's throwing the ball 50 times a game, but still, I mean, they got too many good receivers, too many good weapons. Uh, they need to be able to protect him, which they haven't been able to do. And he, the defense has to step up. They got Jamal Adams, who hasn't done anything. Uh, he had one strip sack last week, but that was it. Uh, in, Sadly. And, that, and they just got bulldozed by the Rams. Yeah. Uh, and just they, they did not look good against the Rams. The, the, I expect them to bounce back a bit tonight, but with the short week, I think that Kyler Murray riding high off that Hail Mary finish against the Bills is going to be the, the difference. I think if the Rams actually come out and they beat the Buccaneers uh, this coming Sunday, then that, that will be their arriving moment and they'll be able to take off and win the division. That's going to be a great game. That's definitely if they a can game do that. to watch it's a big for if. sure. Uh, so that is our show for this week. We're going to be off next week uh, for the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, so we will be back in two weeks. Uh, Harris Berger, Alfonso Caldero. We'll see you then. LDM Radio Sports Talk. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. LDM Radio. Listen to the music, relax, I was saying and have fun. Hi, this is Kelly Clarkson. Hi, this is Madonna. Hi, this is Sugar Bay. Hey.